John. Hear me okay? Yes. Hi. Hi. Uh, hey. How you doing, Nick? Nice and, uh, yeah, great. And Mike, yes. All right. Cool. Um, I agree with Bob. We um, we have a response, a moral responsibility to change the culture. <laughs> and uh, being a hippie, we've done that for, been trying to do that for a while. Um, uh oh. How do I get to the, uh, oh, there it is. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, uh, the, uh, I don't use laptops very much. And, uh, so they kind of confuse me a little bit, but uh, I think I just need to close Bob's. I'll save it. And as program that's in the files here under the documents and uh, pardon me. <laughs> you have to hit twice, don't you? Okay. Yeah, I've, I've always been kind of a Luddite and realized that I can't do that anymore. I even got a smartphone. Oh. Not smart enough to use it yet, but you know, I'm hoping it's going to teach me. So uh, click and slideshow, yeah, I, I do know that. <laughs> and I also know you have to get from the beginning, and here we go. All right, EMI, that's us, all right? And uh, I wonder if I could uh, turn out these front lights a little bit. Do you think that's possible? It's gonna mess up the video, but it's, it's a, we, we'll still have the well, audio. Then, so, yeah, we should be okay. It'd be okay to see it. All right. Still good? I don't know. Anyway. All right, yeah. I usually like it dark because I'm used to doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I wanted to talk about, uh, oh, yeah, me? Well, I don't know. I'm, I, uh, I came into monetary reform. Uh, through uh, a progression, through um, dropping out of society, getting involved with hippies, getting involved with a, a community called The Farm, lived there for 10 years in a collective. Um, when it changed to a cooperative, I left, not being very cooperative, and, uh, which is a problem. Uh, we'll explain that later. And uh, we got, um, and so then I got into the permaculture movement, some yeah. with uh, some no, friends, okay. learned a lot about uh, stuff there, but there were some missing elements about the hidden structures of governance and stuff like that. So uh, got into the Green Party, pursuing that, and it was in the Green Party where I, uh, um, started studying economy because I was running for office and I needed to talk intelligently, you know, about the economy a little bit, which I knew nothing of. And uh, so, when, but as I started looking at it, money seemed like the important factor in there. And so I kept looking at stuff. I read Bernard Leterre and I read Thomas Greco and, and so I was telling, explaining to people, I did a whole presentation to the Greens about complimentary currencies, right? And uh, when I got home, there was a message on my phone from Stephen. He said, hey, I heard you did a thing on complimentary currencies. Uh, I'd like to give you a free ticket to the AMI conference and come on up here, you know? And he, I did, and that made me aware of the macroeconomic reality, which I was totally oblivious to. Even though I was pursuing political economy, you know, I was still oblivious to what the, the story was, what the root of the problem was. So I'm just delighted that, uh, to be here, really. And uh, this is where I live. This is where we live, so I'm kind of isolated. <laughs> and so not a great place to go out organizing people, you know. Uh, but it's a great place to think and write. Um, recently, 14 of us went to the Democracy Convention in Minneapolis. 
Now, I'd been talking to Ben Mansky and uh, George Martin and David Cobb for several years trying to get them to include a monetary track in their things that they've been doing, these conferences. And uh, I think with the help of Greg Coleridge, whispering in their other ear, uh, got us in this year into this uh, democracy conference. And we came in there with 14 people. I think we were the largest delegation. We were certainly the most enthusiastic delegation and the most fun-loving delegation. And it was so contagious, people would gather around to listen to us, what, find out why we were so uh, happy. <laughs> And uh, when I left, I heard uh, uh, just, just my little personal story of leaving, driving out of Minneapolis. I turned on an NPR program, and uh, Mary Catherine Bateson, who's Margaret Mead's daughter, uh, was being interviewed. And they asked her about Margaret Mead's fav fa famous uh, quote, you know, about committed citizens who changed the world, you know, just a small group of, and she says, well, you know, Mom never really said it that. I, I never heard her say it that way. She says, she always said, a small group of committed citizens who are in love with a common cause and who value, even celebrate one another's differences, they can change the world. And that was the experience I had up there with my and my uh, compadres and uh, the feeling that uh, all of us citizens who, who uh, valued and even celebrated one another's differences. And this is what Stephen did a lot too with us as he brought us in. He often uh, celebrated the differences between people and still tried to bring you along to the center, you know, to get, you, get us to that unifying narrative. And so uh, I had done a presentation there, and I was going to share some of that here with you. Um, and I call it climate change and money hacking at the root. But it's really part of my larger project, which is uh, the, uh, the money story, uh, the monetary system, and how to create the economics of care, which is kind of this, uh, you know, I always wanted to write a book, but that takes research and, and uh, lots of stuff to do, you know. And uh, I, I mean, I like reading, but. Uh, a book that seemed like a little daunting to me. So I figured, well, I'm just going to do, you know, the video book, you know, the audio video uh, presentation that we're doing here, but unpack it all as much as I can. But I like to keep things general because we're talking about a system. And a system, you can't really understand a system just looking at the parts. You know, you have to get back and look at them all together. And so, uh, and that's basically what we're doing. And systems are, are a very interesting thing. Uh, we have uh, corporations or systems, you know, but they're kind of a subsystem of the economic system, right? There's a bunch of them. They're all systems. And about systems is they're made up of people doing their job. And they're just doing their job. And they die, live and die, go away, but the system remains, and it just keeps happening, right? We know that. And this system is a living system, and it provides all the materials for everything that we do in our economy, right? And it, it does it without producing waste, because everything that it produces is used by something. And it all does it at all in ambient temperatures. You know, they're not burning fuel to create all of these materials for us, to create wood, to create uh, plant life and uh, minerals and stuff, um, while maintaining full employment. So that's a system we should emulate, right? But we're not because uh, we got a problem with uh, climate and crisis and the sixth great extinction. I don't know if you have heard about that very much, but when you impact the climate the way we are, uh, you're going to start losing species, and we're losing like 200 species a day now. And now, most of them species aren't the species you see. They're not the lions and the elephants, and the, we're losing them too. But most of the species on the planet, you can't see. 
They're, they're microbes. They're down at the microscopic level. And that's where the biologists are saying, hey, <laughs> they're waving flags out there. Almost about four out of five biologists are saying this now. We've got problems, folks. We've got to turn this around. It's looking dangerous. And it's because we have extractive linear systems. Um, I heard an economist talking about this <laughs> on their um, on an interview on my way up here today. But uh, we have linear extractive systems, and our money system is an extractive system. We know that, right? But uh, by linear, I mean that you know we we take, we make, we use, and we lose. You know, we we dig it up, we use it view the waste all around, and all the profits go up to the top 1% or so, and, and that's it. But what I like to point out about these other systems here, oil for energy, right, or agriculture, manufacturing, they're all in debt to this system, right? So they are sort of like subsystems of this system. They extract the wealth for this system. And what we need are productive cyclical systems, not extractive linear systems. And we're already finding ways of doing it with energy, but you aren't hearing much about them yet. Um, agriculture, regenerative agriculture, we know about. We can do that. Manufacturing, right now they're doing the, uh, what do they call it, biomimicry? Right? And then, like the carpet guy and some of the others are, are and Nike's designing shoes that are designed to be recycled from the very beginning so that uh, it's a system that uh, is cyclical. And when we're talking about systems, systems analysts always talk about leverage points. And uh, one of the famous systems analysts who teaches, I think, at Harvard or something like that, he said that, uh, he says, leverage points, you know, you usually don't have to look too hard for leverage points. There will be a lot of people around that leverage point, but they're pushing it in the wrong direction, is what he finds usually, because they don't understand it. But a leverage point is a small point where you can make a small shift in one thing that makes a big change in everything. And so I think this is one of them leverage points in the system. And uh, there are two monetary paradigms, is the way I've been arguing this, and trying to tell people about money. That there's two monetary paradigms. Most people think money's just money and that there's, you know, there's nothing different about money, it's just money. And, but I, I, I've been explaining there's two monetary paradigms. One of them is money issued as a public asset for the general welfare, and the other is money issued as debt for personal profit, which is usury. So we have a system that's based on usury, and the usury is a major sin, so how does that work on society? Well, we have the global wealth distribution. It's not just unsustainable. It's not just. And uh, something I always like to point out, you know, that I, I saw a, a modification of this the other day, and they said there was like 300 people in this section from there up. Uh, And of course, this is a fragile structure. And I always like to point out to people down here that 80%, that's where all the uh, innovation comes from, art and innovation. Not from up there, those guys, that's just the system supplies them with everything they need. They're looking for, which is more money. Donald Trump didn't have to do anything to get rich every year. <clears throat> But this is the kind of economy we'd more like to see, right? With a much more equitable distri distribution of the wealth. And imagine what kind of an economy that would be. Now, we're gonna have a talk about local currency on Sunday, and I was like, that. you know, I came in talking about local currencies, and, and so I, I was enthused about the Wordle experiment. And this was a, a, a money system that was started in the city during the Depression. And they issued money um, that had a demurrage fee on it, which was just a parking fee, so that you, if you put it in the bank, it would just start losing its value. So you had to spend it. And that was to 
keep circulation going. And so consequently, during the 13 or 15 months that the Wordle existed, $4,000 worth did 2.4 million worth of public works. Fixing streets, putting in street lights, built 400 homes for the homeless, uh, all kinds of incredible stuff. It was a miracle. Edwin Fisher wrote a whole pamphlet on it, went around to the cities trying to get the cities to take it on during the Depression as an emergency measure, right? It was a powerful tool. But I always like to point out to people, but wait, it's not just the demerge that was so great. It was public money. It was issued as a public asset. It was issued not as a debt. It was issued and spent into the economy on all the stuff people needed, like those 400 houses, the bridge, and a ski jump they built, a new reservoir. I mean, they started planting trees. They were thinking long term, and that's because of this dynamics of net present value, which uh, uh, you can read about. But uh, and basically, what it's saying is that uh, in a system, say you had uh, pine planted pine trees in ten years worth a hundred, say you plant an oak tree in a hundred years, it's worth a thousand. And with this little business, okay, so here is currency, go oh, wait a minute. <coughs> this one. So at interest, this is currency as a debt, right? 5% interest in 10 years. That $100 is only 61.39, and in 100 years, it's only 730 for the, or 60 for, for this. So in other words, money loses value over time. Whereas, uh, in a negative currency situation, money is more valuable in the future. I don't fully understand that. I'm not a mathematician. But that was impressive. But the main thing was it was public money spent on public works. And that's why it worked so good. And we wouldn't know anything about that if it wasn't good for history, right? History, as Stephen always pointed out, is the science of the human experiment. It's, without history, we wouldn't even know we had global warming. So let's do a little history. Ancient money, well, this is kind of prehistory, right? Uh, there were money systems before debt from them. Now, some people say that there can't be any money that isn't debt. But if it's publicly issued and it's a public agreement, and I always point out, you know, these things are representative of an agreement, and the money is the agreement. These are the currencies. Right? That, that was the currency for that agreement. And those agreements were public and tribal-wide, nationwide, multiple tribes. You know, they had broad agreements, public agreements, about what might be used for uh, exchange or blood money or bridal, you know, bridal troves or whatever, that kind of stuff. Anyway, money had all kinds of functions. <clears throat> but civilization began here in the uh, Fertile Crescent they talk about, right? And uh, began with farming. And they started expanding farming. They started cutting down forests and uh, planting more. And pretty soon they kind of all uh, started battling each other over, over the land. Hey, we want more land for us and more land. Pretty soon it was an empire that consolidated into a big, in the Mesopotamian Empire, right? And uh, and it was a different kind of thing because they started issuing money as debt. Michael Hudson says, anyway, I'm giving, you know, history. <laughs> they started issuing money as debt, and, but it was also when power with changed to power over. You know, it was also when the earth mother goddess was pushed out of the temple and a male god, a powerful male god, was put in. Suddenly it went from matrifocal societies to patriarchal societies. And, uh, and of course, powerful, gold, armed, and everybody's bowing down out here because if you don't, you might get stuck with that thing. It's also when women became property of men. Because power over, right? And the goddess was pushed out. And we became a patriarch. And they built powerful cities, right? Powerful city uh, where Massive deforestation and monoculture farming 
is what supplied the uh, kings with the wealth, right? They kept getting wealthier and wealthier, and people get more and more in debt, and so they had to have, have a jubilee, right? Free everybody of the debt, which they would do once in a while, not out of any social responsibility or anything, just because they wanted to keep issuing money as debt. They couldn't do it anymore unless they could have everybody get out of debt again so that they could keep doing it. It was uh, one of the early examples of a war economy, you know, because they were depending on expansion, constant expansion. But it collapsed due to climate change because they had altered by the deforestation and massive monoculture farming uh, taking the fertility out of the soil, they created, they changed the climate, and they created massive droughts. They, they changed the whole ecology of that uh, region. And uh, they did it in Mesoamerica too. You know, Mayan, Toltec, th those civilizations collapsed because of the, the climate change that they caused in their area, changing weather patterns and stuff. There's, and so, but in America, the tribe just went back out in the woods. But in Europe, the wars continued. <laughs> and eventually, the Spartans revolted it against that. Uh, what was his name? Lysurgis? Lysurgis? Lysurgis, huh? Yeah, how do you pronounce it? Lysurgis. OK, Lysurgis. <laughs> anyway, that guy. He was one of the elite too, right? But he recognized, kind of like Thomas Jefferson, he recognized that, oh, hey, you know, we could do it a different way, it might be better. And so they uh, revolted against rule by the wealthiest, banned gold being used as money, and issued their own worthless money. <laughs> worthless, worthless in terms of a, a currency. It was just a, a old spear points that they heated and dipped in vinegar so it was brittle and worth anything very much, and, uh, and use that as their circulating medium so that nobody who controlled the valuable materials could control their monetary system. Right? So it was a way to protect their monetary system, and they had three and a half centuries of success doing that. Eventually, and of course, they called it democracy. I always like to point that out, you know? Oh, they had revolted against rule by the rich, and started issuing their own money, that's what they call democracy. You know, you don't have democracy unless you've got economic democracy. <laughs> How would you? You know, you don't have any control over what you can do. And of course, we learned a bunch from these guys, those Greeks, you know, about uh, money exists by nature by law. I always run into the, the gold bugs and other people out there, you know, talking about money. But money's created by fiat. I don't care if it's gold. I don't care what it is. It's always created by fiat because gold's not money unless the law says it is. I mean, it's a commodity. It's a trade. That's, that's cool. But it's not money. But all, so there, there was another challenge, right? So, so you had the Greek challenge against the wealth ruled by the wealthy. Then you had the American challenge ruled by the wealthy. And we even got a constitution to tell us all about, you know, all these good things that we can do to uh, ensure the domestic tranquility, promote the general welfare. I got to look at constitutions around the world just recently. And it was showing the preamble to uh, constitutions from other countries around the world. Japan, beautiful. But all of them are much later than this one. But they also have something very in common. That is, none of them have ever been implemented. There's just words on the paper. There's nothing, none of them have ever been implemented. I think we should implement it. And our, our Constitution gave us the tool to do that with, right? Issue the money. But that revolution won militarily, as Stephen pointed out, but lost monetarily. And the uh, same way with Salvador Allende when he he said, well, they said, well, we won the revolution, but we didn't win the power. We still don't control the money. Well, during the uh, colonies, there was a 
power struggle, right, between these guys. One uh, favorite usury and one favorite usufruct. Uh, legal concept meaning that uh, the people have a right to the fruits of the land, no matter who owns it. Uh, Jefferson, uh, I read a great quote recently, Jefferson talking about how, well, the people aren't so smart, but I still think they should be in charge. <laughs> Because I think ultimately they make better decisions than the few who are self-interested. And of course, Hamilton wanted an industrial uh, powerhouse, is what he wanted for the country. And Jefferson, he wanted a peaceful agrarian society for his country. And uh, well, Jefferson was a farmer and Hamilton was a banker, so guess who won? Uh, I've shown this here before, uh, how cost it, difference is, is different under uh, a public system as opposed to a private debt system, but we don't need to go into all of that. Uh, we already are familiar with the Princeton University study, right? And, uh, and that nothing passed in, and we're familiar with the web of debt, all of the banks around, there's about 20 banks controlling the monetary systems of the, all the countries in the world. Um, and so what does debt do? Well, it centralizes power, it centralizes wealth, and it centralizes our food systems. We've got a you know, food system that's centralized. I um, heard an interview by a farmer, and he was talking about, he, he farmed 7,000 acres, his family, and in Colorado, farmed 7,000 acres. He says, he says, you know, it didn't used to be that way. He says, uh, I think it'd be a lot better if I was only allowed to farm 80 acres. There'd be a lot more people living around. And, and of course, this is the same thing that those cultures were doing that collapsed their civilization, except now we're doing it on an industrial scale, a global industrial scale. Not like, not with the old wood plow and then with the metal plow where up in Germany they could finally do it. It's all over the place now. Taking down rainforests. It also centralizes our energy systems, right? So you can narrow it to a thing so they can put a meter on it, right? <laughs> and make money. And that's what it's all about. And uh, efficiently ignoring resiliency. You know, because these things are pushed for efficiency and they fail because of that, because they don't have any resiliency built in that system. It also centralizes population by destroying the local economies. All poor people then head for the city looking for a job, right? That's happening all around the world still today. And uh, big time. it needs to be turned around, yeah, big time. Uh, monetary <laughs> systems are a major influence. They're they shape the flow of human activity in every realm, and it's the most influential of all human design systems. That's the argument I keep making, right? It's the most important and most influential system. That's what we know. That's why we think, you know, everybody ought to get on board with changing this. Because there are psychological consequences to the existing money system. And they're very negative, because the mere presence of money changes people. Uh, and, and of course, it's not money. It's debt. It's usury. And it creates barriers to social intimacy. I heard an interview with an economist uh, on my way uh, up on the train. And uh, he said, there's a recent study that just came out, Sergio confirmed for me, that uh, economists who uh, students, it was a study on students from, you know, from freshman to senior in economic schools. And that they, uh, uh, the more they studied the economic man, the more they became like the economic man, self-interested, ignoring the environment, ignoring the externalities, uh, you know, not a real good model for a human. And then there's the, uh, the test that they did to show how 
uh, uncooperative this kind of money was. This kind of money created all kinds of uncooperative behavior. And this was also used for money, but they didn't tell people that. They just had it up on the wall. They had this picture up on the wall. Now, I've shown you this before, right? You know this stuff already. But this, this uh, if you just Google psychological consequences of money, you read all kinds of stuff about that. And, uh, but the money they're talking about, of course, is debt money. It's usury. And so here's some of those studies. There's a bunch of them out there. I always like to mention that we have a sort of management system. So why do we have such a hard time getting through to people about this stuff? Well, they've been trained not to think about it. They've been trained to avoid that. Because the school system and the media system are both designed to limit dialogue and keep people in a narrow, track of thought and of course we're human so we're always trying to bust out of that but uh, a lot of us are subjected to it um, the school system is the largest uh, client for psychological services they hire more psychologists for the school system than any other industry Media, of course, was based on Bernays' uh, theories about how to control mass populations. And so you can, that's very much happening in media. And uh, so we're talking about hacking at the root, you know, talking about the banks in the bottom. And here's some of that monoculture. Now it's investing in carbon, right? Oh yeah, we're going to tear down all this rainforest and plant these carbon things so we work saving the environment. <laughs> no, they're not. They're doing the same stuff. And it's a parasitic relationship with the planet. We need a symbiotic relationship with the planet, right? Because there's nine planetary boundaries that we should not cross if we want to stay here. But we've already crossed four of them. And two of them are core boundaries, which can drive the Earth into a new state. You know, we have some serious environmental issues going on here that people aren't recognizing yet. Gates offers a solution. He's been putting millions of dollars into this one, pumping uh, water, seawater, into the air to make clouds. Somehow or another, he figures that's going to help. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't see the exhaust pipe for the massive diesel engine it would take to run those pumps. And of course, we got the renewable energy systems, and where everybody's into the renewable <coughs> energy systems, which are kind of intermittent, but they're also manufactured by the same extractive industrial system, and that's what we've got to address, is because these are polluting technologies too. They, they, their fuel isn't polluting because their fuel is naturally free, delivered free to the site, but to make these things make either of these things uh, causes quite a bit of pollution. These guys had better ideas about how to do energy. And instead of trying to work with the solar system or with the systems up here, they were working with Earth systems. They were working with natural systems like, uh, you know, the gravitational system. And uh, Schauberger was working with water and flows and stuff. <coughs> and they did some amazing stuff, and their work was destroyed because of it, because of the free energy. At least that's what certain people were worried about. But we can do it today. Uh, there are technologies already for uh, doing a system where one, like an alternative biofuel plant, livestock, crops, farm vehicles, that can all be hooked up so that the waste of one is the feedstock for the next. And the waste of that one is the feedstock for the next. 